Good morning, and uh, welcome to the meeting of the Subcommittee on Zoning and Franchises. Uh, I am Councilmember Francisco Moya, the chairperson of the subcommittee, and today we are joined by Council Members uh, Reynoso, uh, Rivera, uh, Gradenchek, and Richards. Uh, today we will be holding, oh, and we are also joined by Council Members Lander and uh, Ampri Samuel. And we also have uh, Council Member Levin, who just walked in. Uh, today, we will be holding hearings on a number of applications, and we will conduct a number of votes on several previously heard applications. If you are here to testify in an application uh, for which the record is not already closed, please fill out a white speaker slip with a sergeant at arms uh, and indicate the name and or the LU number of the application you wish to testify on on that slip. Uh, we will now hold our votes. Uh, today we will vote uh, to approve LUs 362 through 365, the uh, 809 Atlantic Avenue rezoning in Brooklyn. Uh, the proposed uh, zoning map amendment would rezone an existing R, uh, R7A uh, C24 district to an R9 C25 in R6A district. The proposed zoning text amendment would uh, establish a mandatory inclusionary housing area, a uh, requested 74-711 uh, uh, special permit would modify various bulk regulations and a requested 74-533 uh, special permit would waive the residential parking requirements. Together with these actions would facilitate the development of two new mixed use buildings of four stories and 29 stories in height uh, with residential and commercial use. The project also allows for the restoration of a landmark church of St. Luke and St. Matthew. Uh, Majority Little Combo is in support of this application. And we will also uh, vote to approve LUs uh, 370, 371, and 372, the 103rd North uh, 13th Street Tax Amendment and related special permit application in Brooklyn. The applicant seeks approval for a zoning text amendment to include the subject block within an industrial business incentive area and a related special permit to allow an increase in the maximum permitted floor area for, uh, for specific industrial and commercial uses, uh, modify height and setback regulations, and reduce the applicable parking and loading requirements. These actions would facilitate the development of a seven-story building with retail office and light industrial use. Uh, Council, mem uh, Council Member Levin is in support of this application. Uh, we will also vote to approve uh, pre-considered LU381 for the uh, 245 East 53rd Street rezoning in Manhattan. The applicant seeks approval of a zoning map amendment to establish a new C25 commercial overlay district within an existing uh, R8B district which would permit commercial ground floor use in a new six-story building on the north side of the street, as well as bring into conformance 25 lots which uh, currently have existing commercial use out of, uh, out of a total 27 lots in the rezoning area. Council Member Powers is in support of this district, uh, of this application. Uh, we will also vote to file pre-considered LUs 367 and 368 for the 41 Summit Street rezoning in Brooklyn. Uh, the applicant has withdrawn its application for a proposed zoning map and zoning text amendment. We will also vote today to approve with modifications, uh, LUs 360 and 361, the former Parkway Hospital site rezoning in Queens. Uh, the proposed zoning map amendment would rezone an R12A district to an R7A district and an R7X district. And the proposed zoning text amendment would designate the project area as a mandatory inclusionary housing area, utilizing options one and two and the workforce option. Together, these actions would facilitate the development of a new 14-story market rate residential building and the enlargement and change of use of the former Parkway Hospital to an eight-story mixed-use building containing 68 affordable dwelling units, 67 affordable independent residents for senior units, heirs, and community facility space. In total, the proposal would consist of uh, 351 dwelling units and approximately 180 accessory parking spaces. Our modification will be uh, to remove MIH option two and the workforce option, leaving MIH option one. Council member Kozlowitz is in support uh, of this application as modified. Um, are there any questions from the subcommittee members on this item? 
Seeing none, I now call a vote uh, to approve LUs 362, 367, 364, and 365, uh, the 809 Atlantic Avenue uh, rezoning applications, uh, LUs 370, 371, 372, the 103 North 13th Street text amendment and related special permit application, uh, and LUs 381, the 245 East 53rd Street rezoning, uh, to approve with modifications I have described. Uh, LUs 360 and 361, the former Parkway Hospital site rezoning applications, and to file LUs uh, 367 and 368, the 41 Summit Street rezoning applica uh, applications. Uh, Council, please call the roll. Chair Moya. Aye on all. Council Member Levin. Aye on all. Council Member Reynoso. I would aye on all. Council Member Rivera. Council Member Gurdenchik. With congratulations to my colleague, Karen Kozlowitz, on the Parkway site, I and all. A vote of five in the affirmative, zero, uh, zero in opposition, zero abstentions. The land use items are approved and referred to the full land use committee. And we're going to leave the vote open. On a continuing vote on the land use items, Council Member Richards. A vote aye. By a vote of six in the affirmative, zero in opposition, zero abstentions, the land use items are approved and referred to the full land use committee. <laughs> Okay, our uh, first public hearing for today is on pre-considered LUs for the 1921 Atlantic Avenue rezoning in Council Member uh, Amprey Samuels District in Brooklyn. Uh, the application by HBD seeks designation and project approval of an urban development uh, action area project and disposition approval. A rezoning of an M11 R7D district to an R8A C24 district. A related zoning text amendment uh, to map the site to, uh, to map the, the site a mandatory inclusionary housing area utilizing option one and an amendment to Saratoga Square Urban Renewal Plan to permit residential and commercial uses. Uh, I now open the public hearing on this application and uh, Dewana Williams, okay. uh, Thomas Campbell, Emilio Perez, are you testifying? Genevieve uh, Mitchell and Felipe Cortez. Okay. Council, can you please uh, swear in the panel? 
As part of your response, please state your full name for the record. Uh, do you swear or affirm to that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and you will answer all questions truthfully? We do. Yes. Please state your name. Thomas Campbell. Felipe Cortez. Uh, Genevieve Michael. Thank you. You may, you may begin. Uh, the following pre-considered items are related to proposal, proposed ULERP actions for a project known as 1921 Atlantic, in Atlantic Avenue in Brooklyn Council District 41. The project area includes 12 city-owned underutilized vacant lots located at Block 1557, <coughs> lots 3, 4, 23, 26, 28, 31 through 37, uh, or the disposition area and three privately owned sites located at block 1557, lots one, two, and 38, uh, the private sites. The ULERP actions before the count city council involve urban development action area project uh, designation and project approval of the disposition area and private sites, disposition of the city owned properties that make up the disposition area, as well as a zoning map amendment, a zoning text amendment, and an amendment for the Saratoga Square urban renewal plan. Uh, more specifically, the item related to C-1901-61 ZMK seeks to eliminate the MX-10 Special District, change the underlying, underlying manufacturing district to a residential district, and establish a commercial overlay. Uh, and N-1901-62 ZRK seeks a zoning text amendment to map the development site as an MIH area. Additionally, the item related to C-1901-63 HUK is related to the First Amendment to the Saratoga Square Urban Renewal Plan, which was originally approved in 1992. The city-owned sites are designated urban renewal area sites, 175, 176, and 177, which were designated and approved for disposition for industrial uses. The amendment is necessary in order to permit residential and commercial uses on the disposition area. Uh, number C-1901-60 HAK is related to the proposed project that will be developed under HPD's Extremely Low and Low Affordability Income Program, or the ELLA program. Uh, the ELLA program provide, uh, seeks to create rental housing for low-income families with a range of incomes from 30% to 60% of the area median income. Projects may include a portion of the units with rents affordable to households earning up to 100% of AMI. Uh, projects also include units rented to formerly homeless families and individuals. The development site located at 1921 Atlantic Avenue will be developed by a sponsor, selected through a competitive process geared towards certified MWBE organizations. The proposal includes the construction of a 14-story mixed-use building with 236 units, inclusive as, of a supers unit. Under MIH option one, 20% of the residential floor area must be permanently affordable housing units affordable to households with an in, in income at a weighted average of 60% of AMI. Additionally, as per HPD's requirement, an additional 15% of the units will be permanently affordable. Therefore, based on the number of rental units for the project, 36 units will be permanently affordable in addition to the MIH units. The building will comprise of 52 studios, 79 one-bedroom, 59 two-bedrooms, and 45 three-bedroom apartments. 10% of the unit count will be set aside for homeless households. Targeted incomes will range from up to 30% AMI to 80% of AMI. Rents will range from $251 for a studio for a homeless household to $2,096 for a three-bedroom apartment for a family of four making uh, around $10,000 and $86,000 annually. The project also includes about 15,000 square feet of commercial floor area for a grocery store, uh, 7,953 square feet of community facility space, and 44 below grade parking spaces. Uh, at this time, no commercial facility has been identified. Uh, the ad anticipated use for the community facility space will be occupied by Oco Farm, uh, Brooklyn Neighborhood Services, and ACMH. Additional amenities for this project include an art gallery, outdoor recreation spaces available to tenants on the roof of the second floor and at the rooftop of the building, two fitness centers, and approximately 108 spaces for residential bike storage in the cellar. Other residential amenities in the proposed development include a laundry room on each residential floor, recreation rooms accessible to tenants on the first and second floors, a computer room, and a separate Skype room. Uh, in order to facilitate development of 1921 Atlantic Avenue and the creation of affordable housing units, HPD is before the council seeking approval of each of the pre-considered uh, numbers outlined above. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, council members, sub zoning subcommittee and staff. I am Dewana Williams, founder and managing principal of DeVar Development Partners, here with my joint venture partner, Thomas Campbell of Thoroughbred Companies. We are presenting as designees 
of HPD's MWBE Building Opportunity RFP. As has been mentioned, we are presenting the Project 1921 Atlantic Avenue. As you are aware, to facilitate this project, HPD is seeking a number of land use actions. Um, they include UDAP designation and project approval for the disposition of the city-owned property, a zoning map amendment for the residential component, a zoning text amendment as an MIH area, and amendment to the Saratoga Square Urban Renewal Plan to permit, to permit residential and commercial uses. As you will see from the map here on the screen, the yellow area outlined in red includes the 12 sites that are owned currently by HPD and the city. Um, as you will see from the purple and blue area um, are the private sites which have been acquired by my partner Thomas and I as an assemblage for a full square contiguous um, development site. To add a little bit more site location and context, you will see that the property fronts on Atlantic Avenue just across the street from the Long Island Railroad. It sits between two one-block streets, um, Prescott Place and Bancroft Place. The wider thoroughfares, which you may be more familiar with, are Ralph Avenue and Howard Avenue. The site sits just two blocks from good public transportation um, where there is a C train there is all, there also, the site is also served by two public um, bus stations, um, the B-47 and the B-25. Um, the site additionally is currently blighted and the project would se seek to cure the blight that is um, currently existing along this thoroughfare. To give you a quick summary again, the project is 14 stories um, of mixed use. Um, there are 236 affordable rental housing units. Um, they are 100% affordable, and they will count towards the mayor's New York housing plan to build and preserve 300,000 affordable units. There are also 15,000 square feet on the ground floor, which we are reserving for a grocery store, fresh, because the neighborhood is currently located in a food desert. Um, there are four community facility spaces, which my partner will discuss in more detail. 44 below grade parking spaces and um, a mandatory inclusionary housing component under option run one. Um, I will turn the floor over to my partner Thomas Campbell to provide further details about the project. Thank you, Duana, and good morning. Thank you for having us this morning. I'm very excited to be here. Um, we work collaboratively with, um, as Genevieve and Duana had mentioned, with HPD as well as Council Member uh, Alika Amphrey Samuel's team and with the local community board three in Brooklyn to really create a responsive residential and community program that we're proud of and given the work we put into it, we're very proud and confident in our plan. In terms of the, the residential program, uh, given the flood of uh, residential homes, affordable homes at the 60% of the area median income tier, we really wanted to be responsive and provide opportunities for homes at the very low income tiers and, and equitably up to the moderate income tier as well, what we call the forgotten moderate tier um, as well. And we cap those responsive to community um, need at 80% of the area median income tier. Specifically, we have 10% of the homes for the formerly homeless, 10% at 30% of the area median income, 10% at 40, at 50, and then 30% of the units at the 70% AMI tier as well as 30% at the 80% of the area median income tiers. And as you can see from the program, rents will range from $251 per month for the formerly homeless all the way to a cap of 2,000, just, over, just under $2,100 per month for a three bedroom apartment at the highest income tier at 80% of the area median income. Next slide, please. In terms of our community program, again, this is really a bottom-up approach. We initially uh, contemplated a medical office at the space, but given community input, it was clear that the need was for uh, a fresh food initiative. This is, we've done the research and identified this as a food desert where there's a lack of fresh food options for this community where the local mom and pop shops have been sort of priced out of the neighborhood who used to provide those amenities. 
So we really made the idea of a fresh food um, offering the central theme of this project. So essentially we have a 15,000 square foot met, uh, um, community or a um, grocery, fresh grocer, pardon me, complemented by a ground floor aquaponic farm to provide a farm to table offering for the community. And on the roof top, we have actually hydroponic farm as well, again, to support a farm to table offering to get uh, the community access to uh, uh, fresh foods and fresh food education. In terms of um, other input from the community, we understood that this community is defined as a community of uh, local entrepreneurs. And we wanted to support local entrepreneurship, so we brought on board Oco Farms, as Genevieve mentioned, who's a Brooklyn born and bred neighborhood aquaculture farm provider who's going to provide services and run our aquaponic and hydroponic farm operations as well uh, in terms of supporting our local community organizations. As Genevieve also and Duana also alluded to, we are having as um, having neighborhood housing services to locate their headquarters into our building, which we're really excited about that to be a community service center, as well as ACMH, a local provider of supportive services for the formerly homeless, will be on our uh, eastern uh, border of the building. And then to the west side, we're going to have um, Oco Farms and the Aquaponic Farm to be located there. Next slide. Oh, sorry. My favorite part of it was actually the art gallery. My wife's an artist. And um, we have provided space for local artists, given that there's a lack of affordable art space in the community. Apologies, thank you, Felipe. So in terms of our streetscape, uh, we are, our uh, residential, our um, ground floor program abuts the busy Atlantic Avenue, which is one of the busiest thoroughfares in all of Brooklyn. So it's necessary to have the entrance is uh, for the project to be on the side streets of Bancroft and Prescott. So you'll see here that the front of the building, which abuts Atlantic Avenue, does not have an entrance there where the grocer is, but the entrances for all the programming is all on the side streets of Bank Prescott and Bancroft. Next slide, please. Here you have Atlantic Avenue and the eastward Bancroft Place. It's the western border of the project. You'll see that it's been plagued by a massive community dumping, which is the blighted condition that my partner Dewana spoke of. Now we're going to have our entrance to the fresh grocer there, as well as the entrance to ACMH, the supportive housing provider, the entrance to the art gallery, as well as the entrance to neighborhood housing services. This is going to drastically improve the streetscape on Bancroft Place. Next slide, please. And then we have uh, a look at the the east, or sorry, the, the west, uh, western border where Atlantic Avenue and Prescott Place, where the residential entrance will be, uh, as well as the entrance to Oco Farms. Again, it's going to be a notable upgrade to the streetscape. Right now, the uh, street is home to abandoned automobiles, and so it's going to be a great improvement to the streetscape. And I'll pass it back to Duana Williams to talk a bit about sustainability. Thank you. Finally, the building. Thank you. Um, finally, the building will be built in accordance with um, Enterprise Green Communities, which is a framework for sustainability and resiliency by HPD. The building will include water monitoring to detect leaks and water sense labor fixtures. There will also be a rainwater treatment element on the roof to, to collect additional uh, water that may be used in other parts of the building. There will be Energy Star certified appliances for high efficiency. And then finally, and we believe most importantly for the building, uh, we will have HVAC uh, heating and cooling that is run by a VRF system on top of the building as opposed to the grills that you normally see that um, facade on the, that are normally on the facade of buildings. This will allow for a more compact and efficient, um, efficiently closed building and also for less noise. Um, finally, as Thomas has indicated, we've worked very closely with the community and the community board and other stakeholders in the community. We're planning on a robust local hiring plan uh, with an initiative from local people within the community. Thank you very much and we welcome any questions. Hey, we're just gonna pause briefly. 
Uh, we are joined by council members Constantinidis, Lansman, and uh, Torres. Uh, we're gonna open it up, uh, or continue the vote. Sorry, yeah, continuing vote on land use items. Council member Constantinidis. Aye. Council member Lansman. Aye. Council member Torres. I vote aye. By a vote of nine in the affirmative, zero in opposition, and zero abstentions, the land use items are approved and referred to the full land use committee. Thank you. Just a couple of questions before I turn it over to uh, Council Member uh, Amprey Samuels. Uh, and, I'm, and I apologize if, if you said this, but you are pursuing the fresh program benefits for the supermarkets? Not technically. <laughs> um, so we are. So, so we're not, so not we, we are not pursuing the, there's a, there's a zoning component and then there is the financial component. We are not pursuing the zoning component, but we will be pursuing the financial component for the grocery store tenant. So that tenant can pursue tax savings for labor that they hire. Okay. And will the community fa uh, facility tenants be offered affordable long-term leases? Yes. Um, so, so all of all except for one the the all except for the um, Brooklyn neighborhood services may be offered a more market lease but all of the others are either free or very affordable okay. ACMH is going to have a 30-year lease with us the support uh, of sorry, ACMH the supportive serving provider yeah. has a 30-year lease with us for free for free thank you <laughs> uh, and I just want to sort of now just turn to talking about um, uh, good jobs and uh, one of the things is for us to know is are you planning to pay the building service workers at your project uh, prevailing wage standards uh, once it's operational? Uh, and if not, uh, what will the building service workers earn? Uh, and are you planning to provide full family health care? Um, and what would the employees share that cost be? We are working on a plan for um, the amount of the wages. The wages will be determined based on budget, budgetary research, but we are working on a plan now. The community will be involved in our local hiring. Uh, but uh, again, is the project gonna be prevailing wage standards? No. It's not? No, it is not. Okay. Uh, and then can you tell me if any of these employees will be provided uh, full health benefits, uh, are you planning to provide retirement benefits, things like that for your employees that are coming uh, in? As I mentioned, we're working on a plan, but we don't know just yet. I can't definitively say. Absolutely, and well, then you're saying, of, well, to me, you're still not there yet. So, yeah, yeah, and, and you're asking if we're gonna provide employees with the benefits of healthcare and the like, and uh, we would provide healthcare and benefits. The question is, but the prevailing wage, we at this time we're not doing prevailing wage, but absolutely we're going to offer them to the healthcare benefits and, and the like. That's our intention. What opportunities for training and career advancement do you plan uh, to provide um, workers at this project, if any? I'm sorry. I'll, I'll opportunities for once again, please. Yeah. What opportunities for training? or career advancement do you plan to provide to workers at this project, if any? So with regard to um, the construction trades, uh, we do plan to utilize program. Um, this is on the construction side. Uh, there's apprenticeship program, building skills, where we're gonna provide opportunities for local uh, people in the community to, to participate in the construction on our project. Which uh, apprenticeships? Which, apprentice, which, yeah, which apprenticeships? Which apprenticeships? Well, essentially, you want to just one other thing. Um, in the, I'm not sure if you were able to see it from the graph, but the Brooklyn Neighborhood Housing Services will be, we will be building um, a workshop in, within that facility that will include electrical and plumbing trades to be trained in that facility. Um, if you look at the green diagram in the back, there's about a 900 square foot space which would be trained for trades uh, by Brooklyn Neighborhood Services. Right. So just for the construction trades? That's correct. Okay. Um, and do you have a plan to ensure that the workers on this project will have job protection, uh, access to uh, strong health care and safety protections as well? 
Yes, we do. Okay. So it is also important to us that the members of the surrounding community have access to the jobs that uh, create the affordable housing projects. Do you have a plan to hire locally? And if you do, could you share that with us? Yes, we are already in communication with uh, a very strong local firm um, for local hiring. I apologize that the name of his firm escapes me right now, but we've been in close contact with them. And would you share that, that plan with us? Yes, we will. Okay. Happy to. Okay. Um, I'm going to now uh, turn it over to Councilmember uh, Amprey Samuels. Thank you. So staying on the same track of thought, I, I think Thomas might be looking up who the <laughs> local the organization is. I was trying to look up the local organization and the name of the principal. I have the guy's name, but I don't have the name of the organization. Well, uh, there's a guy, would you mind if I? Idris Abdullah um, is a representative of a local hiring organization that we're working with that's going to help us to source uh, local work for our, our project. Is that somebody that just introduced themselves and said that I help with local hiring and... Well, we met him in, in, um, at, during our, our meeting with the Community Board 3, actually, mm -hmm. and so we've been in contact with him. And he's and on the Community Board as well. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, and excuse me if, I, if it wasn't clear. You showed a slide about a training facility with NHS, and it sounded as though that was your response to the question about local hiring. So can you explain how a facility that is being built would help train people to build it? That's what it sounded like to me, and so that didn't make much sense to me, and so I just needed a little bit of clarity sure. around. Um, Unless you didn't mean to say that. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't mean that. I apologize if that was the, what, it, what it sounded like. I thought the question was, what were we going to do to uh, assist people with um, jobs moving forward, with moving up and being trained in the future? Okay. So okay. that was the answer regarding people moving up and being trained in the future. Um, regarding moving up within the building? Well, that was the part I didn't, I didn't understand, but the question seemed to be, what w are you doing to help people to grow um, in the construction trades or to grow in, in building? Do you want to clarify the question? I think my question was clear. Okay. I'm sorry, I didn't understand I, I it. thought it was very clear. I'll say it again. <laughs> what opportunities for training and career advancement do you have to provide workers at this project, if any? You then said, uh, we have this facility and it is specifically going into apprenticeships uh, through the trades. My follow-up question to that was, what apprenticeships have you uh, mm -hmm. uh, agreed to, and with what trade unions has there been that discussion with? Can I talk a little bit about it? Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna try to clear it up here. Um, I responded initially to the project, to your question, talking about trades to actually build the building, and then I was talking about service workers. Oh, okay. Yeah. You brought up the trades. Right. I followed up. Right. Who are you <laughs> right. now uh, engaged with for those apprenticeships? They're two different things. Two separate things. So you separate. said to me you have a training facility, and that's why I ended it there, yeah. saying that it's just for the trades. Okay. Correct? Yeah. So, a built, so for the trades, for building on the building in response to Alika's question, because I can see how that's confusing. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Building skills um, keeps track of all new construction projects, particularly in affordable housing. And fortunately, we have a relationship with them. And they reach out to us and they say, how many jobs do you have that are available for apprenticeship programs? Uh, we have a, a um, estimation for the amount of jobs that we're creating uh, for, through construction. And a portion of those jobs will, be, will go through a program of apprenticeships starting uh, as soon as possible to get them going through apprenticeship so that they're ready to work on our project when they're done. And so I can get you more information about the building skills program and exactly how far in advance of the start of construction that that happens, but that's, that's how that happens. And so we have a relationship there and that's what we do in terms of the trades. And in terms of training post-construction, I think that's what Alik, what um, Duana was talking a bit about with neighborhood housing services. I hope that helped out a bit more. You seem to have a follow-up question. Feel free. 
my apologies if I, if I didn't clear up your question. No problem. I know that you have uh, uh, more questions, so I'm just going to turn that over and I'll come back afterwards. Okay, so this is, um, I apologize, this is going back to the prevailing wage reference. Sure. So how many people will the project employ? Like how many people will actually work in the building that are building service workers and what will those jobs be? In our model we have um, one super. One super. Uh-huh. We have four uh, porters. One super, four porters. Uh-huh. And then we have three um, security, full-time security for the project, which is going to be great for the project, actually provide 24-hour security in the project. Okay. And then it'll be like, with not the, the, the super, but the porters and the security workers, will those be in shifts? So instead of, like, so three would turn into nine? Right. Oh. Mm -hmm. Well, three to account for 20, so eight hours and eight hours and eight hours. So it'll be just three okay. in total. Yes. Okay. So are you able to calculate how much it will cost if they were to all, if it was to be prevailing wage for nine plus, I don't know, eight. <laughs> but I went to law school. I'm not an accountant, yeah. but I don't know, 15 people or so? So to your... Two and a half million. Two and a half. So yes, we are able to calculate. And the answer that I'm getting my partners... Two and a half million. Two and a half million dollars uh, of additional cost to the project. So looking at the full cost of the project and looking at everything that we see happening just across the city and the need for prevailing wage and everything else, is there a way to be able to even put it into a T? Because I've seen with other projects where they will, the first year, the numbers would look like this, and then in the second year, they can get them up to prevailing wage. Was that something that was discussed at all? Yeah, I mean, I think that in order for the project to stay under HPD term sheet, we would either need, uh, what we've done on other projects is either a uh, res OA from the council or some other change to the project, but I think on a project where we're doing an ELLA, which is a low income building, and also uh, have you know discounted community facility space, it would be very difficult for us to absorb the cost and actually have a project that we uh, could move forward on and close. I think the two and a half million dollars would be a pretty big gap, but again, happy to have further conversations about where we could either identify uh, cost savings or look for other sources of funding, which I think, again, we've done on other projects. Okay, all right. Uh, and I have to go back to the um, fresh market program because this was something that was discussed in great detail with the community conversation, the fact that there's such a um, lack of fresh fruits and vegetables in that particular, in that neighborhood, in that area. And just on a personal level, like I know this past week, I went out with my mom looking for um, just a salad. And we went to three different grocery stores and there was not one grocery store that had fresh lettuce. And I also know that we had a project um, not too far from this project, and they was committed to a grocery store. And, and I'm talking about Prospect Plaza. And this project has been open for over a year, and there's still a vacancy for a grocery store. And now everyone was committed, the city was committed, the um, developers were committed, everyone was committed to this. And we have not seen that happen. So what are you doing um, to have a real commitment to a fresh market? Well, I know, so I, and- Because we know it's difficult. Yeah, absolutely. Well, but I it looks good on paper. Perspective, I appreciate that perspective. All I can say is, for here is that it is the central element theme for this whole project. That's why we have aquaponic and hydroponic elements to complement it. It's the most important part of the project. Um, what are we doing? We're, um, we don't, we, we spend a lot of time scouting for prospective grocers. We do have candidates now to put into the space. We know what the community actually wants, so we're working to do better. 
Uh, we have uh, candidates for, to, for, for again, for active tenants that we have today, but we're working to, to, do, to do better. Um, we're working not only for the, 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 the reason of providing this amenity to the community, which is the most important meeting, uh, meeting um, most important reason, but financially we need, we're working to pre-lease the space because it, it helps the project economics as well. Because if we don't pre-lease the space, it's gonna cost us uh, tremendously in a um, master lease structure or a letter of credit structure, which is gonna make the project financially, um, put the, the, the challenge the project financially as well. So we're working very, very hard and tirelessly to find the right tenant for the community. And we can always stop working and give the community what we have in our toolkit today, but we know the community deserves better, so we're, so we're still working. And just to add to what Thomas just mentioned, we do have two letters of intent from actual grocery stores. Um, the issue is we're seeking, you said you wanted a fresh salad, for example. The issue is we're seeking um, a grocery store that provides organic and fresh produce um, in a way that we haven't seen from the two that we do have the strong um, letters from currently. We like to provide something that's more appealing to the community, but we're, we do have two in hand. Uh, and I think, you know, Prospect Plaza certainly predates my time at HPD, but happy to follow up with our teams to figure out what has happened there and if there's anything we can do to urge it along. Okay. And just a couple more questions, Chair. Will you partner with the local nonprofit organization as a ministry agent for the affordable housing? As a what agent? As a as a marketing agent? Or what? The administering agent, yeah. yeah. Administration. And coupled with that too, and I guess just to, to, to explain a little bit too, um, we see a lot of these affordable housing developments come up and, the f and a lot of the people that it was supposedly meant for, uh, we don't see the moving in, and that's another piece of it. So um, can you just talk to us a little bit about sure. who you'll be partnering with and working with? We, we haven't chosen anyone yet, but we have um, acknowledged, we've talked with the community and they've, they've told us the same sentiment you just mentioned. So we have agreed to work with them on choosing um, the right agent that is agreeable to both the development team and the, and the community. Um, so we don't have the camp, we don't know who it is just yet, but we will be doing it um, in consultation with the community because we understand that concern. Okay, and my last question. I know we talked about local hiring and we also talked about the um, building service workers. Can you describe your plans for ensuring that MWBE and locally based contractors and some contractors participate in the development? Can you just talk a little bit about that and your commitment? Sure, um, obviously um, my firm is an MWBE firm. Thomas's firm is also an MWBE firm. Um, we have a strong interest in ensuring that the project meets um, targeted thresholds for MWBE. Um, in the past two projects that I've done with HPD, we hired a uh, general contractor that was um, an MWBE, which helped to ensure that we exceed 30% on both of those projects. Um, we plan to do the same thing here. Our general contractor is not an NWBE, but we do plan to hire um, a consultant that will help them with the trades. Okay, and this is really my last question because I do have to leave. Um, and you answered a lot of it in, in the previous statements. The development site is directly on Atlantic Avenue and the LIRR tracks. Is the building being designed to help reduce noise and emissions, em emissions into the apartments? And can you also speak to um, the traffic between the two um, streets, between Ralph Avenue and Howard Avenue, because they both go northbound? And I know there's some conversation about the flow of traffic to yes. eastbound with Atlantic Avenue. Um, we are working on a plan now in consultation with both DOT and DEP as you mentioned, both Bancroft and Prescott are one block streets that both run one way northbound. Um, DOT has asked us to consider, and we talked with them about it as well, changing one of them to flow in the other direction so that traffic flows clockwise around the development. We are still finalizing it. And the second is, um, as we, we mentioned, the, the heating and cooling will be different. Normally you see a building and there are grills on the facade of the building. Those are called PTAC units. Um, we are paying for a much a more expensive system where there would be no grills on the building, so it will be tight and shut. Um, heating and cooling will exhaust through the roof, which will cause um, it to be 
much less noise, uh, and, and that's one way we'll deal with the noise, and the traffic will hopefully be better because of the clockwise direction. We're also receiving other consultation from DOT, but we haven't received their final plan yet, but the clockwise direction is the main plan they have. Thank you so much, Chair, for the opportunity, and um, I look forward to working with you. I've already stated that um, this has been something we've been discussing for the past year, and I am very happy about everything that you have incorporated from the community uh, conversation, and again, I look forward to working with you. Forward to working with you. Thanks so much. So I'm just going to come back with a couple of follow-up questions. Um, what is the developer fee that you will earn on this project? The developer fee is, the total developer fee in the latest model is about $14 million. The current portion of the fee will be about half of that, about $7 million. That fee will be paid after the project is built after there's TCO, after it's leased up, and after we convert, which it will be um, about five years from now. After that, the, not, the deferred portion of the fee that is not paid will be paid out of cash flow over 15 years. So there's not a lump sum of a fee that comes to us. The first part will come in five years, and the rest will come hopefully in five years if we're on schedule with our construction and the rest will come over 15 years. And those are fees to our prospective companies, not to us individually. Thank you. Got it. Uh, and then have you budgeted to earn a profit from the operating income of this project? A profit from the operating income? Of the project. So I'm not sure how to answer that. The, yeah, the, the, Obviously, to make the project work, it has to show a profit, um, although that's not always the so case. You, but the, the, the pro forma shows that the, that the project profits about $159,000 per year, starting with the first stabilized year. As Thomas mentioned, that's approximately five years from now. Wait, so you're saying in five years, your profit is going to be how much? Approximately $159,000. That's the total cash flow, not profit. That's the total cash flow from the project. Right, so it's not a profit, that's the total cash flow from this entire project will be $159,000 per year. And so that's what you're going to see in and when you And you ask about profits, sorry, uh, you know, I, that, I guess on the other side of the income is our, our operating expenses. I don't think we know whether or not we're making a profit on those. I'm sure every person knows what their profit's gonna be when they come in and do a development because that's what you do. I gave you the so cash flow. Okay. That's the number, $159,000. Now, I'm, as Thomas I'm, has I'm mentioned, there are other expenses coming from it, but I, I it. gave but you the I, answer I'm, that I'm you were looking for. I'm responding to what he just said. So that's why I'm like, everyone has a budget. They have a model. They know what their profit margins will be. And that was just my question. I, and like, I gave you the answer. OK, I got it. I'm just looking at the total cost, given that you said it's going to cost $2.5 million to do prevailing wages. So That's I'm, only for I'm, the construction I'm part of it. I'm going through the numbers with you so that I can see where you guys are going to be. And that's sure. why I'm asking these questions. Sure, absolutely. I don't think that uh, there's a need absolutely. for uh, you, know, you to be defensive about it. I'm asking you a I very simple question. That's all. Absolutely, sure. I and as you can see, yeah. there's very little cash flow to pay for prevailing wage. Got it. OK, thank you very much for your testimony today. Thank you. Thank you so much. Next, I'd like to call up uh, Jessica Ortiz. Good Please morning, see. Chair yeah. Moya and members of the subcommittee. My name is Jessica Ortiz. I work as a porter and have been a member of 32BJ for six and a half years. I'm here on behalf of my union to share our concerns about the proposed rezoning and the lack of good jobs that pay the prevailing wage for building service workers in new affordable housing developments. 
My union represents more than 80,000 property service workers in New York City. We clean and maintain buildings like the ones proposed. As you know, we ask the developers to make credible commitments to pay building service workers the prevailing wage once their building is operational. Unfortunately, the developer for this project, DeBar Development Partners and Thoroughbred Companies, has not made this commitment. We fully support the development of affordable housing, but it is time to stop building affordable housing on the back of workers. Our taxpayer dollars should be building housing that comes with jobs that pay the industry standards and allow working families in the city to breathe. This means creating jobs that provi provide livable wages, a defined benefit pension, full family health with no employee premiums, and more. At this hearing alone, between this project and others, the council is considering hundreds of units of affordable housing, all without a commitment to the high road standards that allow families to make it in New York City. The workers at the projects before you today will, li will likely come from the surrounding communities. They deserve better than publicly financed projects that can pay as low as minimum wage. And 32 BJs, 35,000 members in, re in the residential sector in New York City, and our 3,000 members in affordable housing deserve better than to have their wages and benefit standards they have fought for undermined. It is because of developments like the council that like these that council member Espinal has introduced a bill intro 1321 that would close the loophole in the city's existing prevailing wage law and require affordable developments that receive city subsidies to pay workers the prevailing wage standard. Chair Moya, we greatly appreciate the work that you have done already to lift up this important issue. We are looking forward to working with the city council to ensure that the affordable housing creates family sustaining jobs citywide. In the interim, as, and as a step toward this goal, we are urging you to ensure that the city and the developers commit to prevailing wage standards at affordable projects that come before this committee before they are approved. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, are there any other members of the public who wish uh, to testify? Uh, seeing none, I now close the public hearing on this application and it will be laid over. Uh, our next public hearing is on LUs 369 from the McDonald Avenue rezoning uh, for property and council member Landers District in Brooklyn. Uh, the applicant seeks approval of a zoning map amendment to map a new C24 commercial overlay district uh, within an existing R5 district to facilitate the continued operation of a commercial banquet facility located within the connected cellar level spaces uh, of two adjacent school buildings. Uh, I now open the public hearing on this application. Do you have a uh, let me call the panel. Adam Rothkirk. Good morning. Uh, one, one, one second, I'll just sure. make sure we have. Mordecai Schwartz. There, uh, I understand they were delayed and are parking their car on the way up. And Yahuda Klein? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, they were for answering any questions anyway, so I'll go ahead with the presentation if that's I'm okay. I'm going to have the council to swear you in. Sure. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Uh, and then you will answer all questions truthfully, and please state your name as you respond. Yes. Uh, Chair Moyer, uh, Councilman Lander, uh, Councilman, um, my name's Adam Rothkrug. I'm here on behalf of Congregation of Kazadeh, Bells, Beth Malka, in connection with the pros, proposed application to add a C24 commercial overlay to an existing R5 zoning district. The commercial zoning is designed to permit the continued operation of their existing commercial banquet facility located in the combined cellars of the buildings at 600 McDonald Avenue and 317 Day Hill Road in the Borough Park section of Brooklyn Community Board District Number 12. They're shown on that, uh, uh, the first slide above uh, the McDonald Avenue being the long, very long building and the Day Hill Road building behind that. Uh, in addition, the subject property, the rezoning includes five existing buildings uh, along Avenue C, uh, shown on the right there. Uh, 
but similar to the subject, these, this rezoning will not result in the creation of any new additional floor area as the underlying R5 residential dis zoning will not be affected and the existing buildings are overbuilt uh, so that the change will not allow the enlargement of any buildings on the site. The existing banquet hall, approximately 20,000 square feet of gross air floor area in the cellar of the two buildings uh, during the day serves as a cafeteria uh, for the two schools. It accommodates approximately 400 people. Uh, at night, it's used for uh, uh, affordable uh, banquet facilities in, uh, in this area, uh, approximately 150 to 160 events uh, per year. Uh, the facility uh, had a, or has a place of assembly permit from the Department of Buildings uh, indicating uh, uh, its compliance with all applicable uh, building and fire uh, safety regulations. Both of these buildings were approved by the Board of Standards and Appeals. Uh, at the time that they were approved and built, uh, the facilities really thought that the catering activities were a part of the, their mission in the community and didn't realize that opening it up from uh, what would be considered as purely accessory uh, activities to uh, activities and events open to the public uh, would create a potential zoning issue. Uh, and when one of the buildings went back to the Board of Stands and Appeals for an enlargement, this issue came to light and uh, it was urged that we file this uh, rezoning application to uh, uh, legalize or at least bring the commercial catering into compliance with zoning. The area that's proposed to be rezoned is a mixed-use area with the mixed zoning districts all around. Uh, after discussions with city planning, the C2 overlay was selected as an appropriate uh, buffer between the subway on uh, McDonald Avenue and as you see manufacturing districts to the west uh, and uh, as well as commercial districts and uses uh, in the surrounding area. Uh, shown on this in the purple, in the orange, uh, in the blue, uh, all indicating non-residential uh, uses. Uh, so uh, there is no housing proposed as part of this application. Uh, this will not result in any changes. The catering facility has actually been operating for about 10 years without incident. Uh, there were no speakers in opposition at the community board, uh, so we received the support of the community board and the borough president. And uh, I want to thank uh, Councilman Lander for working with his office in this interim period while the facility has still been operating uh, while we try to uh, uh, dot the I's and cross the T's. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. I'm going to turn it over to Council Member Lander. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you for the application and moving it forward. And, you know, look, the, I feel lucky to represent the, the strong and vibrant and growing uh, Orthodox and Hasidic community, including the Belzer community in Borough Park. It's no secret that creates a set of uh, real estate tensions as there is a need for both school space and event space, and that puts you into a dynamic relationship with sometimes is not easy with residential neighbors such as the ones next door here. Um, you know, and, and I've been able in the past to support some projects of the Bells community, and sometimes I've had to say that one is not a good mix with the proposed site. Obviously, for the reasons that you articulated, this site is an appropriate one. Uh, in particular, the kind of entry and exit and impacts are on the side with the manufacturing and commercial uses and the, the subway tracks um, and not the residential side on, on Day Hill. So I appreciate all of that. I guess the one thing that I do just want to uh, have you commit to on the record is a thing that's been part of the dialogue with city planning, and that's about off-site parking obviously events like this in some cases people are walking from nearby and that's wonderful in some cases just depending on where the bride and groom and their families live or whatever the event is there are a lot of people coming in cars and that can be a significant impact on the neighborhood especially given that often there are school buses sometimes related to the school sometimes not related to the school parked on mcdonald so can you just articulate what the applicant has committed to do uh, in terms of off-site parking uh, to make sure we do not have sure. um, out of control uh, traffic and parking <laughs> incidents on the nights of events. Sure, so uh, uh, just for the record, there's no parking technically required under the zoning resolution. 
Uh, that said, uh, the Board of Standards and Appeals has been very interested in parking, as it was the Borough President's Office. Uh, the uh, facility has uh, uh, leased, and I'll use the pointer here, if you can see it, a parking uh, area uh, about a block away, uh, just around the corner. Uh, we have a lease for approximately 50 cars uh, that is utilized uh, during, event, during the larger events uh, and is available to us for any events. Uh, the, we did actually, as part of the Board of Stands and Appeals process, uh, do a uh, off-street uh, parking, I mean an on-street parking analysis, uh, which found that on event evenings, the parking is, uh, uh, versus non-event evenings, that there's not a significant difference. Uh, it's near 100% capacity in the area. We do have the advantage, obviously, of having McDonald Avenue adjacent to us, which is uh, uh, available for parking, but uh, we are committed to continuing uh, uh, an agreement to uh, uh, maintain off-street uh, parking for our events. How long is the duration of the parking agreement? So it's, it's actually a year-to-year -year lease. Uh, it doesn't, uh, uh, that, that parking is not used. It's a, it's a large building there. It's not used during the evenings, so it hasn't been a uh, problem at all. We don't foresee any uh, difficulty continuing to use it uh, on a continuing basis. And uh, we are, uh, as well, uh, always have our eye out for additional facilities, as well as uh, we've located an area on the southerly portion of our site that we think that we can uh, kind of move around that might accommodate uh, up to uh, 15 or 20 cars. So. Uh, uh, we have our eye on, obviously, the success of the facility uh, does depend on people being able to access it and get there, so uh, we are as interested in making it convenient uh, for uh, uh, patrons as well as visitors, and uh, again, uh, one of the advantages is, unfortunately, I guess, of being open for a long time is that you're aware of if there are problems or not problems. and. Uh, I think during the course of these proceedings, uh, with the exception of uh, uh, with one neighbor that appeared early on and we relocated our garbage facility and we've taken other steps to address uh, those complaints, uh, we uh, have uh, been well received in the community. And, and I'll underline that, you know, there is a, a f another facility that has opened fairly recently and is an event facility not too far away where the neighbors complain on a very regular basis and in this facility, my, which has been open now several years and as you say does over 100 events a year, we do not get significant complaints. So that speaks well to the kind of management and operations that, uh, that they have in place here and, and that matters a lot. And I know that with a continually growing community, um, uh, they'll be back for a, a future additional applications and, and, and being in situations that work out these challenges with their neighbors in ways that are productive means a lot when that happens. So as much as I wish in some ways there were a longer term agreement on the parking, um, I know with this community that um, keeping those good relationships is in their own self-interest for their own relationships with their neighbors, but also with this council because we will, I'm sure, be reviewing future applications. So um, with the commitments that are made and that set of understandings, Mr. Chair, I'm supportive of this application and will encourage my colleagues to do the same. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Council Member. Thank you for your testimony today. Um, are there any other members of the public who wish to testify? Uh, seeing none, I now close the public hearing on this application and it will be laid over. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. Uh, our uh, next public hearing for today is on LUs 382 through 385 for the Bruckner Boulevard rezoning in Council Member uh, Diaz's district uh, in the Bronx. The applicant seeks approval of a zoning map amendment to rezone an R5 district to an uh, R7A district and an R7A C2 C4 district and a related zoning text amendment application uh, which seeks, uh, seeks to map the site uh, seeks to map the site a mandatory inclusionary housing area utilizing option one, as well as article 12 tax exemption uh, for the home ownership building and for the rental building. As proposed, this, these actions would facilitate the development of two buildings, including 65 affordable home ownership units, uh, 265 
uh, rental units, retail space, and 158 parking spaces. Uh, I now open uh, the public hearing on this application. Uh, but before we be begin, I want to read Council Member uh, Diaz's uh, remarks. The 2069 Bruckner Boulevard is currently a large plot of land located between two major avenues in my district. Uh, the area is largely populated by homeowners, uh, some apartment buildings nearby, and a long-standing Mitchell-Lama building just over a block away. Uh, this project plans to facilitate two new buildings which will fit the landscape of the surrounding area. The first building will stand as a nine-story, 265 affordable rental unit apartment building with 50% of those apartments marked for families earning under 70% AMI. My district is a working class district comprised of family, families earning low to moderate income. Therefore, I am uh, comfortable calling this an affordable project because the AMI bands are truly inclusive of the incomes in the area and these apartments will be for the people of this community. Uh, I hope to see this project, I hope to see this project sets the precedent for the other development projects planning to make their way into <laughs> District 18, Council District 18. Uh, we must continue to fight for projects that are truly affordable, preserve public benefit, and keep the people of our community in the community. Uh, the second building is uncharted waters, but truly is exciting for the future of housing in New York City. This building will be a seven-story, 65 affordable home ownership apartment building. With rising uh, housing costs throughout the city and the nation, it is imperative that we offer the tools and resources to our constituents so that they may become homeowners in this unforgiving market. I commend HPD for taking this on, and it will be the first affordable home ownership in the Bronx through HPD's Open Door program uh, right here in Council District 18. Uh, the home ownership units at uh, 2069 Bruckner Boulevard will be subsidized for middle income families to finally achieve the American dream of owning a home, but this time at, but this time at an affordable price. 5% down payment and a fixed interest rate. I want to thank uh, Azimuth for being cooperative throughout this process and addressing the community's concerns as well as my own. I want to thank them for committing to a competitive wage and health care for their building workers. Uh, I want to thank Chairman Moya and the entire land use team here at the City Council for their tireless work uh, on this project such as these. I look forward to hearing more from the public and more importantly my constituents on this project as this project moves along. Thank you, uh, Council Member Ruben Diaz, uh, uh, District 18 in the Bronx. We have uh, Frank St. Jacques, is that it? Uh, Guido Subataski, thank you, sorry. Genevieve Mitchell. Uh, Alice Friedman. Thank you. Council, can you please swear in the panel? Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and that you will answer all questions truthfully, and uh, please state your name as you respond. Frank St. Jacques, yes. Guido Subatowski, yes. Uh, Genevieve Michael, yes. Alice Friedman, yes. Thank you. Uh, so I, since there are technically two items here, I have separate testimony on each, but I will read them quickly in a row. Uh, in conjunction with a private application for a project known as Bruckner Apartments, located at Block 3797, part of Lot 33, land use number 384 seeks Article 11 tax benefits for the proposed exemption area in the Soundview section of the Bronx in Council District 18. Uh, this portion of the project will be a rental building that will be developed under HPD's Mix and Match Program. HPD's Mix and Match Program provides funds for new construction of mixed income multifamily rental pro projects in which 50% of the units are affordable to low income households and 50% of units would have rents affordable to moderate and or middle income households. Uh, the developer is proposing to construct a multiple dwelling that will provide uh, 265 units of rental housing and one commercial facility space. The unit mixture will include 56 studios, 111 one-bedroom, 79 two-bedrooms, and 18 three-bedroom apartments, as well as one two-bedroom unit for the super. Uh, in an effort to assist with continued affordability of the rental units, HPD is before the council seeking full Article 11 tax benefits that will coincide with the regulatory agreement for a term of 40 years. 
the estimated cumulative value of the tax exemption is uh, $53,205,312 with a net present value of $13,652,390. Uh, land use number 385 is also related to the private application submitted by Azimuth Development seeking Article 11 tax benefits for the proposed exemption area located at Block 3797, part of Lot 33 in the Soundview section of the Bronx in Council District 18. Uh, this portion of the project, which is known as 2069 Bruckner Boulevard, will facilitate new construction of a multiple dwelling that will be developed under HPD's Open Door Home Ownership Program. Upon construction completion, the developer will sell the ownership units to households who agree to own or occupy their units for the length of the regulatory period. If the purchaser sells or refinances during the regulatory period, the purchaser may recapture up to 2% of appreciation on the original purchase price per year of owner occupancy. Additionally, upon resale, the purchaser will be required to sell to a household making no more than the project's income cap. Currently, the sponsor is proposing to develop a building on part of the site that will provide 65 units of cooperative housing. Uh, the current unit mixture types include 16 one-bedroom, 33 two-bedroom, and 15 three-bedroom apartments. Anticipated maintenance will average uh, $606. No commercial or community facility space is contemplated for this portion of the project. In an effort to assist with affordability the home ownership units of the home ownership units, HPD is before the council seeking full Article 11 tax benefits that will coincide with the regulatory agreement uh, for a term of 40 years. The estimated cumulative value of the tax exemption is uh, $7,454,893 with a net present value of $1,968,692. I just realized I didn't hand these in, so I will do that now. <laughs> yes. Thanks, Genevieve. Um, good morning, Chair Moya. Uh, uh, again, my name is Frank Sajak from Ackerman LLP, appearing on behalf of Azimuth Develop uh, Development Group, LLC. Uh, I'm joined by Guido Subotowski of, of Azimuth. Um, I'll uh, run through the land use actions in the application and then we're uh, all available to answer any questions. So as you can see on the, the slide uh, outlined in red, the proposed rezoning area and development site are located in uh, the Soundview neighborhood, neighborhood of the Bronx in Community District 9 at 2069 Bruckner Boulevard, uh, which is bounded by Bruckner Boulevard to the south, Olmsted Avenue to the east, Chatterton Avenue to the north, and a line approximately 300 feet from Olmsted Avenue to the west. Uh, the Bruckner Expressway, as you can see on the, the graphic there, is located immediately to the south. Uh, the development site uh, shown on the area land use map, it's located within an R5 zoning district that is mapped generally north of Bruckner Boulevard. There are existing commercial overlays mapped to the west of Pugsley Avenue along Bruckner Boulevard and Castle Hill Avenue to the east. The development site, again, is, is within an R5 zoning district. It's also within the transit zone and in an area where fresh discretionary tax incentives are available. The site is approximately 61,000 square, uh, and a, approximately 61,000 square foot rectangular corner and through lot. It has approximately 289 feet of frontage on Bruckner Boulevard and Chatterton Avenue and 211 feet of frontage on Olmsted Avenue. Bruckner Boulevard and Olmsted Avenue are both wide streets pursuant to zoning and Chatterton Avenue is a narrow street. Uh, the site is currently improved with a one-story building uh, with a large surface parking lot. It was previously used as a supermarket and most recently as a house of worship. Uh, the site's near public transit. And it's approximately a half mile south of the Parkchester station uh, serving the six subway line. And it's also in close proximity to several bus lines including uh, express routes to Midtown Manhattan. So the applicant is seeking uh, two actions today uh, in addition to the Article 11 uh, zoning map amendment to change the current R5 zoning district to R7A with a C24 overlay map from Bruckner Boulevard to the center line of the site and to a depth of 100 feet from Olmsted Avenue. And the applicant is also seeking a zoning text amendment to establish a mandatory inclusionary housing area, an MIH area, with MIH option one. The, Zoning change map uh, illustrates the proposed zoning change. Uh, it's, it's shown um, the existing zoning is shown on the, the left-hand side of the screen, and the proposed zoning is shown on the right-hand side of the screen. 
the proposed zoning change from R5 to R7A and R7A C24. The proposed zoning change is also shown on the tax map, uh, and you can see that the uh, commercial overlay, uh, which is represented with, with hatching, uh, extends um, sort of in an L shape along the, the wide streets in the site. The proposed actions would facilitate the development of two new buildings at the development site, a seven-story residential building on Chatterton and a nine-story mixed-use building on the south and east portions of the site along Bruckner and Olmsted. Overall, the proposed development would contain approximately 281,000 square feet of total floor area. That's including approximately 263,000 square feet of residential floor area and approximately 18,000 square feet of ground floor commercial floor area along Bruckner Boulevard and Olmsted Avenue within the commercial overlay. In total, the proposed development would provide 330 housing units. Approximately 83 would be permanently income restricted units under MIH option one, uh, that's about 25%, with an additional approximately 50 permanently income restricted units per HPD policy, that's an additional 15%. That's resulting in approximately 133 permanently income restricted units at the site. So as I noted, the, uh, these actions would facilitate the development of two buildings. Uh, the first building uh, is a seven-story residential building on Chatterton Avenue on the north side of the site uh, that has 65 units, uh, approximately 64,000 square feet of residential floor area. The building is 70 feet tall, but steps down to 50 feet or five stories at the western edge of the site. Uh, the, the building will have a primarily brick facade and incorporate articulation and other materials to create visual interest and break up the massing. Uh, this building, as, as noted, uh, will be financed through HPD's Open Door Home Ownership Program, marketed to households earning uh, between 80 and 90% of AMI. And the second building is a nine-story mixed-use residential and commercial building, wrapping the Bruckner Avenue and Olmsted Avenue frontages of the site. It has 265 units, approximately 198,000 uh, square feet of residential floor area, and again, approximately 18,000 square feet of commercial floor area on the ground floor. The ground floor will be a qualifying ground floor uh, and will be glazed for transparency, uh, both to activate the streetscape and enhance the pedestrian experience along Bruckner and, and Olmsted. Uh, this building is 95 feet tall, uh, above a 75-foot base, and there's uh, 10 foot setbacks on each frontage. Uh, it also steps down uh, to the western edge of the site to 55 feet or five stories. Uh, this building uses different colors of brick uh, and metal paneling along with articulation. Uh, and as has been mentioned, uh, it will be financed through HPD's mix and match rental program. So I'll just quickly run through um, the, the next few sli uh, sides, uh, excuse me, slides. Um, the site plan here illustrates the various heights of the buildings, the setbacks, and the step downs, uh, and side yard on the western edge of the site at the proposed zoning district boundary. Uh, that's pursuant to the transition rule and the zoning resolution um, that the, the building is, is required to step down uh, adjacent to the existing R5 district. Uh, the applicant has proposed decking over the at grade parking, uh, which is shown here at the center of, of the site plan. Um, and the, the next few pages are um, uh, floor plans showing the cellar first and second floors, which will show how the proposed parking is treated at the site. So here's the cellar plan. Uh, parking will be provided in a cellar uh, level parking garage, uh, which serves both buildings. There's 99 self-parking spaces in the cellar. And on the next slide, the first floor plan, there'll be 60 additional spaces at grade. These are also self-park, and they'll be fully enclosed. As you can see here on the second floor plan, uh, the parking enclosure will create a landscaped open space uh, above the, the parking on the first floor. So the next few slides are schematic massings of the proposed development from, from different views. Uh, here's the building shown from the south, and you can see how the, uh, the massing of the building is, is concentrated along the Bruckner frontage and along Olmsted, the, the wide streets. Uh, then the site from the southeast. 
the Northeast and the Northwest. Uh, Genevieve from HPD just mentioned the unit distribution breakdown. Here it is again here for, uh, for both buildings. Uh, the proposed um, homeownership building has 65 units and the rental building would have 200, 265 units. Uh, so it will be 330 units in, in total. And we're happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Uh, just, a, just a couple of questions. Um, can you speak to your relationship with uh, the local non for profits on um, how you're helping with uh, local residents work and live in the project? Yes, I'll actually uh, hand the microphone to, to Guido to field that question. Thank you. Good morning, Councilman Moya. I'm um, sorry, you, you said with respect to local hiring for construction? Or? No, just uh, local residents uh, that will work and live on this project. So whether it's construction, whether it's service workers, mm -hmm. you know, how is that? Sure. So uh, we were actually, we, we received a great deal of assistance from Community Board 9. Um, this is not our only project uh, in construction actually in this district. We're currently under construction uh, a few blocks away at 1755 Watson Avenue, which was also a ULERP. Um, so we've already been working with Community Board 9 in introducing us to groups to assist us with, um, you know, hiring for, again, construction, permanent jobs, and also when the time comes um, to give awareness, obviously, for the housing. So we were introduced to, um, the name of the group escapes me, I, I believe it's called United, um, construction workers. there it is, United Hispanic Construction Workers and uh, Building Skills NYC, which is a little bit of a newer group, but those are two of the groups that uh, Community Board 9 was able to introduce us to to uh, assist us with providing opportunities to those within the neighborhood. So you've, you're already working with those two non-for-profits? We just began uh, that process on the other project and would be uh, as we get closer to construction of this. Got it. Uh, and are you planning to pay uh, building service workers at your project uh, prevailing wage standards uh, once it's operational? Uh, it's, it's a non-prevailing wage project. Um, okay. So what will building service workers earn in this project if it is a non-prevailing wage? A super, so the building is going to be staffed with uh, one super per building and somewhere between three and four porters per building. A super would earn a salary of approximately $55,000 per year, uh, plus they would receive a two-bedroom apartment, of course, free of charge. Um, the market rent for such an apartment is in the neighborhood of two. You said two-bedroom apartment? Yeah, I believe it was a two-bedroom apartment. I think on your, and maybe I saw it wrong, but it said super, and it was designated with a one-bedroom apartment. Was it a one-bed or two? It? Did I see that wrong? Well, in the right. breakdown of apartments. Oh. Includes uh, supers units. Is it a one bed or a two bed? And it says one bedroom. I think it's a two bedroom apartment. Oh, apartment. I'm sorry. You're, so one of the buildings is a one, one of the buildings is right. a two. Right, okay. Sorry. I just wanted to make yeah, sure. Yeah, no, we're, we're good. Apologies. Um, I was confusing the two buildings. Um, and then in addition, we provide, um, we provide uh, health care benefits for both uh, supers and their families, which is just something we do as a matter of course in all of our projects. The total pay package when you consider the salary, uh, the apartment and the health care comes into a little bit over nine, just about $90,000 for a super. What does the employee share that cost? So in terms of them paying into the, uh, the we, health No, we, we cover the cost of the health care. So they don't? Correct. Okay. Um, We've also begun, um, one of the new things that we've done uh, throughout our buildings, is we, we're actually just now in the process of um, instituting opportunities for things like 401k and uh, programs of that nature for our supers and service workers. Okay. Well, that was my next question, if you were planning on providing retirement benefits. Yeah, I recognize it. Yeah. Um, and then just what are your plans to address the community board's request for this project? We've talked a little bit about uh, the prevailing wage. Uh, we talked about the two non-for-profits um, that, that are here. Uh, but what about the set aside for retail community space, uh, for community programming um, that would 
goes specifically for senior and veterans uh, preference. Also, the contribution annually to uh, the closest neighboring schools, parking allotment, um, and over here, they have also the commitment to create high quality building service jobs that pay union standard salaries and benefits. So we had, you know, again, we've, we've had several conversations with Community Board 9 throughout uh, the life of this project, having pre uh, presented to them informally several times prior to uh, ULERP. Some of the uh, requests that uh, came up in the Community Board recommendation um, came a little late in the late in the game and were not initially part of our, our discussions with them. Uh, however, just to address them individually, um, the idea of providing community space for programming and, and space for local groups is something that we did not have a problem with. We also did it for them or are doing it at 1755 Watson down the block. Um, the contributions to the Parks, the uh, Virginia Park and Hugh Grant Circle, um, you know, again, is not something that was discussed. It's not something that's present in our project underwriting. However, um, it is something that we are amenable to discussing just as a matter of being a stakeholder in the community and, uh, you know, contributions of this nature are something that we do, again, just as a matter of course. Also, the, the question about the, the parking available for the retail, you know, we have plenty of parking on site as well. So are you, are you saying that you've closed conversations that this project is going to be uh, a non-union uh, project, that you're not paying prevailing wage on this, uh, for service workers on this project, or is there conversations going on? Can you kind of walk me through where you guys are at? And conversations are ongoing as the project has a little bit of a ways to go by the time we get to construction loan closing, uh, but at this time, it's not a prevailing wage project. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony today. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Are there any other members of the public who wish to testify? Uh, seeing none, uh, I now close this hearing on this application uh, and it will be laid over. Please note that we will be laying over resolutions uh, 748, uh, an authorizing resolution pursuant to section 363 uh, of the city charter, also known as the Staten Island Bus Franchising Resolution. We are also laying over LUs 373, 374, and 375 for the Bondell Commons rezoning in the Bronx. Uh, and we are also laying over LUs 379 and 380 for the 1640 Flatbush Avenue rezoning. Uh, this concludes today's meeting, and I would like to thank the members uh, of the public, my colleagues, the council and land use staff for always uh, doing a great job uh, to make this uh, body run. Uh, this meeting is now adjourned.